Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Mike Shanahan and I'll be moderating the event today. This webinar has been organized by the Earth Journalism Network, which is a program of the global media development organization Internews. Earth Journalism Network or EJN has a mission to improve the quality and quantity of journalism around the environment and it does this by helping journalists around the world to report on climate change, biodiversity and conservation, pollution and other issues by providing story grants, uh, training fellowships and other kinds of support. EJN is also a community of more than 13,000 journalists in about 180 countries. So if you're not a member yet and you'd like to be one, please visit earthjournalism.net to register. And by registering with EJN, you'll be able to find news about funding opportunities, uh, fellowships and events like this webinar. So today's webinar is part of EJN's Biodiversity Media Initiative, which is a three-year project that you can read all about on the EJN website. And over the past year during uh, the pandemic, EJN has been doing quite a lot of uh, webinars on biodiversity topics. But today's focus is more on the craft of reporting on biodiversity. And we're going to have first up speaking will be EJN's special reports editor, so special projects editor, Sam Shramsky. And he's going to introduce EJN's newest project, which is a free online course all about reporting on biodiversity. We're then going to hear from two journalists, Caroline, Caroline Chebet from Kenya and Mahima Jain from India, who are both going to talk about some of their recent experiences of reporting on biodiversity issues in their countries. And for those of you who are watching this live, uh, if there's something that you'd like to ask any of our speakers, please use the Q&A feature of Zoom, not the, um, not the chat box. We'll be checking the Q&A feature and putting your questions to our panel of journalists throughout the event. And with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to Sam to tell us all about this brand new biodiversity training course. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Mike. And uh, thank you to all the organizers of this webinar. Um, looking forward to the discussion that we have uh, throughout the session. So I'm just going to share my slides here. Um, so indeed, this the course that Mike mentioned is the first course that uh, EJN um, has developed for um, on, on the subject of biodiversity. And um, this has been a massive undertaking, in part because the subject of biodiversity is so all inclusive, and, and we'll talk about that in a second. But we really have oriented the entire uh, purpose of the course towards journalists um, of different stripes and of different levels, um, and many of whom may or may not have experience in covering biodiversity topics, but with the intended result of perfecting um, their craft, obviously in terms of reporting just generally on the environment, but um, as it pertains to biodiversity subjects um, across the board. And we'll talk a little bit about those different um, themes um, and in the context of the course, um, mostly under the guise of modules. So this is if you were to open up the course right now, you would see something very similar to this. This is one of the uh, learning platforms that we use in uh, the course entitled From Microbes to Rainforests, an introductory biodiversity course for journalists. And uh, it's a highly dynamic course. And we'll talk about the different elements of it in a second here. But um, it, uh, it's definitely an online learning, engaging online learning environment that um, you can carry out um, on your own time. It's a self-paced course um, done asynchronously, meaning you don't necessarily interact with anybody uh, whilst you're taking it. Um, and, uh, and, and again, we'll also talk about a little bit of the details surrounding that, but this is how it would sort of look visually as you first enter in. These are sort of a few things that we'll, uh, I'll briefly touch upon, sort of the motivation for developing the course, uh, who's for, what's in it, and how does it work. The graphics, I'll just make a, a, a brief um, shout out to Sean Crozier, who was the graphic designer for this course, who um, illustrated quite a few uh, incredible pieces, including this, this uh, image here, and you'll see throughout the course. So just sort of eye candy to whet your appetite. The motivation for the course, I suppose, in some sense, is uh, is a simple one. Uh, biodiversity is a wide-ranging topic, right? And we, uh, many of you in attendance right now have probably 
uh, produced stories that are tangentially or very directly about biodiversity. Um, and that's because it's arguably the most wide ranging um, subject that one can cover. It's probably less arguably environmental journalism because it touches upon so many different um, themes um, and aspects of the environment. Um, just sort of put it in numeric or quantitative dimensions, there's about, this number is sort of, uh, um, doesn't strain credulity, but there's sort of numbers all over as to how many species there are on the world. Um, and you can imagine um, by that scientific notation, how many trillions and trillions of individuals in those species that exist. Why is that important? Well, it sort of gives you a sense of the magnitude of everything that is touched um, by the subject. So of course, in a scientific lens and the very dry way, you could say biodiversity is something that increases stability by promoting the balance among those interactions, basically flows of energy and materials in an ecosystem. Well, that may not be particularly engaging to your audience, to your readers, to your viewers. Um, and, uh, and of course, in this course, we'll uh, go into ways of making it more engaging. But if you were to translate it um, to the public at large, if you haven't already, um, one of the things that you could say more directly is biodiversity is both a product of and a contributor to the planet's life support systems, if you didn't want to talk about flows of energy and materials. Um, so in one sense, it regulates diseases, uh, disease dynamics, including, um, as we probably, um, many of you are well aware about zoonotic disease transmission and COVID-19 and its uh, relationship to biodiversity, which we go into in the course, but things like soil health, water quality, uh, and crucially right now, concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and in relationship to climate change. It's essentially vital to human health and to well-being as well. So it's not necessarily just something over there, it's something in here as well. Um, so there are a lot of hot topics um, right now in the news um, and both in 2021 and 2022. Um, this many uh, scientists in the biodiversity realm as well as policymakers think that 2022 is a make or break year um, and uh, in, in large part due to the uh, uh, Convention on Biological Diversity's Convention of the Parties, uh, the COP15 that um, is taking place in parts and, uh, and the big decisions that will be made about the global biodiversity, post 2020 global biodiversity framework. There's been a lot of recent studies that have sort of reaffirmed this idea of a mass extinction, including a new report that came out a couple of weeks ago that talked about um, uh, a large uh, undercalculation for the number of invertebrates that um, uh, are facing extinction or have faced extinction. So lots of studies like this that have been trending recently. And then of course, in the last year, you might've um, picked up on something like this, like a report from the IPBES, which is the biodiversity equivalent of the IPCC, which more people are familiar with, that linked to the relationship between um, uh, the climate crisis and, um, and biodiversity loss and the implications um, um, of biodiversity loss. You've also probably realized in the past year and literally in the past year, because it was in uh, January that much of 2021, that much of the news uh, surrounding the 30 by 30 uh, initiative was made both globally um, at the United Nations, at the IUCN level and, and by a host of countries that uh, bilaterally made agreements about protecting 30% of the planet by 30, uh, by 2030. And as well, in, in, in the uh, case of the United States, there's an executive order which hasn't made a lot of, um, hasn't gotten a lot of traction, but it too um, uh, promised to follow along suit with this 30 by 30 goal, at least in, the, in, in, um, in a very uh, domestic lens here in the United States. So there's been a lot of news surrounding 30 by 30, which is directly linked to biodiversity and conservation. And then finally, as I alluded to, um, a huge amount of news. Uh, for journalists already in 2021, because the Convention on Biological Diversity, the COP15, which will is forming this new global biodiversity framework post 2020, um, met, but it was delayed. The meetings went back and forth. Eventually, there was a virtual session um, in uh, in Kunming that was hosted in Kunming, China, in October, and there will be another one that will most likely be hosted uh, in person or hybrid um, in the next couple of months here in 2022. In the meantime, there are working groups that um, are ongoing surrounding the uh, uh, authoring of various uh, different documents uh, and pieces of draft um, legislation, uh, draft frameworks for, um, for what will eventually be adopted in, uh, in the CBD COP. The course audience, um, thus, as you can imagine, is 
from all levels. Again, it could be uh, journalists who have very little uh, have little, very little previous interest in biodiversity, but now realize that this is a uh, uh, topic al current that may be of interest to um, uh, their readership or their audience or their viewers beyond um, an environmental lens. Uh, obviously, EJN has a large focus on low and middle income countries, um, journalists from those um, locations, um, environmental journalists, those in the EJN network, and really any and all who have uh, a curiosity about the link between the news media and the environment, and that could be journalists uh, or not, the public and researchers and the like. So the layout of the course is there's an introduction um, with an intro, each of these is a module. So one to six represents different modules, an introduction, the concept of biodiversity, um, concepts um, used in the course and um, often um, the shop talk of scientists when discussing the idea of biodiversity, two contemporary issues, and much of this sort of um, aligns with what's being discussed uh, at the CBD in different aspects, but also the science and contemporary trends surrounding issues of biodiversity, governance, which of course uh, is not just the Convention on Biological Diversity, of course, that's often what we focus on when talking about biodiversity governance, could be from a local level, um, all the way to obviously international frameworks like the CBD uh, and like other international frameworks, uh, the CBD is not the only international um, treaty that um, governs and relates to biodiversity. There are actually a handful um, which we go to in the course. Ways of localizing biodiversity news seems like this far-reaching um, extensive um, subject, but there are ways that we've pointed out about how to localize it, especially for journalists who work for local media outlets that don't necessarily have the opportunity to cover something so expansive. So we go into that. Um, good sources and resources for your reporting on this subject um, and this rather expansive subject. And, um, and then of course, sort of a solutions approach. Um, what are the practices and pitfalls to um, using a solutions lens or a solutions approach to biodiversity journalism, um, which uh, sort of is the capstone. Um, this is what you would see uh, as you entered into uh, the course, the learning management system that we use, which is the, the platform um, is Learn AMP. And um, you would essentially just have this uh, screen that allows you to navigate through the course and on the side demonstrates the different modules. Um, within, within the modules, at the end of each module, there's a quiz, which you'll take. Um, that's a summative quiz for um, each module. And then at the very end, uh, there's a larger quiz, larger, I guess should say, summative quiz, um, which um, is, is sort of and is the capstone of the course, and then there's a there's a certificate that comes thereafter. So you will receive a certificate um, after uh, filling out an evaluation form. The whole thing should take about eight hours uh, um, on average. It's full of various different dynamic elements, including videos and graphics. Again, these are some of the graphics um, uh, illustrated by Sean Crozier, but there are many others um, and, a, and a variety of different videos and exercises which in line with best practices and, and um, uh, self-paced learning um, to sort of uh, really um, engage the material uh, for journalists and, and learners to engage with the material and also to use these exercises in a fashion that might be useful to their own reporting. So they're not just um, sort of abstract exercises, but there are a series of exercises throughout the modules that we're looking uh, and hoping that um, those taking the courses can actually utilize and translate into their own work, into their own uh, journalism, um, et cetera. So we're really uh, looking forward to that. And that is perhaps the most dynamic element uh, in the course. And as I mentioned, there are quizzes. This is a rather, perhaps an easier one compared to some of the questions. It sort of depends. Um, just sort of the mechanics of it, you would, um, if you haven't already, you would head over to earthjournalism.net, which is a website for uh, the Earth Journalism Network. You would register yourself in our system. You would find the course click access the course, fill out a course sign up form. You must be registered in our system previously or before you do this, before you sign up. And then you'll be sent an invite link um, for the learning management system. And I know this sounds a little bit, um, I don't know, Byzantine or something, but this is really a way um, for you to uh, garner the resources and the benefits of being within our network. Um, and at the same time also being connected in, in our online learning community. So it would be essentially, you would register within Earth Journalism Network, you would go to the course environment, online courses under resources, access the course, fill out this brief, very brief form. And once you fill out that form, you'll be invited 
um, by our course assistant, uh, Erica Ferrer, who is um, uh, assisting us for the next few months. And that's all there um, that I have for you today. Thank you so much. And I really look forward uh, to working and, and, um, and perhaps communicating with some of you uh, throughout the next few months um, as you uh, delve into uh, biodiversity reporting and journalism. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. I've, I've seen some of the draft course content, so I'm really looking forward to getting into the finished product now that it has all of the, the graphics and photos in it. Before, before we move on, can you just tell me what you think the, uh, the most challenging aspect of creating this course was? It's a good question. Uh, it's, I think the, you know, there are lots of little sort of technical issues here and there, but frankly, Mike, the most difficult thing is how to encapsulate a subject that is so vast and far reaching in a way that is useful um, to our journalistic community and, and to our community of practice here at EJ. And I think it's, it, it was really the challenge because, um, you know, I think the, a lot of the reflexive thinking is, oh yeah, I know about, I, I see, uh, um, I see it in, in sense that I know what it is just by virtue of, um, you know, exposing myself to the outdoors. Or I just have a sense of what biodiversity is just because it's all around us and therefore I can write a story or produce a good piece that um, that is compelling um, j just based on my own in, uh, experiences. And I think, so I don't necessarily think that's true. And so I think part of the issue in developing this course was finding a means of explaining the complexity um, while without being overly complex, but also showing the different branches and, and, and different avenues to explore uh, for journalists all throughout the world, because our, uh, our network and our community and, and, and those with whom we wish to interact with are all, all around the world and, and have different beats, um, could really uh, gain something from this. And so I think that was probably the biggest challenge was the, a large subject, um, and, um, but not necessarily just assuming it is um, uh, what it is based on, um, you know, your just experience on, on, on the internet or even being outdoors, but really um, sort of understanding the complexities based on, on um, you know, some of the less explored avenues of, of, of the subject. Yeah, I think I think there's a tendency for people to assume that biodiversity just means just wildlife or, or even just conservation, but it's it's so much more of a, a complex and detailed subject than that. So I'm glad to see that you've gone into such depth in this course and that, um, you know, you can really get beyond those those simple concepts of biodiversity into much more uh, things that are relevant to, to us in much deeper ways. Thanks a lot, Sam, for your presentation. Uh, we're going to move now from theory to practice and hear from two of the journalists who have produced stories on biodiversity with EJN support in recent uh, months and years. And remember, anyone listening in, if you've got any questions, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom if you want to uh, put your questions to our panelists. First up is Kenyan journalist uh, Caroline Chebet, who produced a story for The Standard newspaper on the illicit trade in endangered African grey parrots. Caroline, if you're ready, uh, please begin. Caroline, I think you're muted still. Yes, I think it is okay now. Yes, we hear you now, yes. thank you. Yes, I'll Sure, thank you. I'll, uh, today I'll share my story on uh, on I, I'll share my story that ran in the Standard newspaper in Kenya. The story also ran in the UK's Independent newspaper. It detailed on the it is an investigative story telling the tra the trafficking of African grey parrot an endangered bird, but the, the investigative story talks about the, the trafficking, especially in Kenya. So we will move to the first slide. Oh, yes, uh, this, is, this is the African gray parrot. This bird is found, found in uh, Eastern, Eastern Africa, mostly in Kenya, Uganda, and in the western side of Africa, central and west Africa. 
that is they are found in abundance in west and uh, and central africa but in east africa in uganda it is it is not as much as in in the central and uh, west africa so we move to the next slide this is uh, uh, the story it ran in may on may 31st and it was a series it was a this story was supported by a grant from internews and uh, it was a, a series story it ran in two consecutive days on that was on may 31st last year and first uh, we can move to the next slide So I'll share how I I came I came to working on this story, sourcing and pitching the idea. What makes the, what what made my story unique? While researching for the story, I realized that the, this is one of the most traded birds in the world, and uh, and little stories have been told, especially in the East African part. In Kenya, this bird is found in only one forest. And that is why I was very interested. It gave me an interest to really well, dig about yeah. this, this story. And then sourcing basic information about the story, like the background, where the birds are found, why it is trafficked, who are those people who are trafficking this bird. And then I also identified the sources of the, to tell me the, this story. Most of the, my sources, were the local communities around that forest. This forest is the last fragment of the Congolian, of the equatorial forest stretching for, from the West Africa. And uh, my story basically was around that forest. So I identified a community around there. And then I also, I had also to look for wildlife traffickers of which this, most of the traffickers were online. And then I had to do a lot of, to contact a lot of researchers, those who initially did a survey on this bird. And also I had to, to contact conservation organizations in Kenya who deal with bird conservation, like uh, conservation agencies like Nature Kenya and uh, World Animal Protection and government agencies also. We can move to the next slide. Now, now we come to researching the story, how I source the information. I sourced most of my research were based on, uh, from the internet. It was a six month, it, it was a story stretching for six months. So I had to come up with a work plan to, to come up uh, with one, uh, with the time I am doing my own research. So I had, I had to, to look for the statistics for the report. And then I, like in this story, the picture there is, a, is, a, is from a report from, Af, uh, from World Animal Protection. It is titled Wild at Heart. So I, I looked at this report and realized that it unearths the trade of this African gray parrot, but it was in, the, in West and Central Africa. So I wanted my story to tell about the trafficking in East Africa. So it is more of localizing the story, the untold story in the East Africa. I visited the websites that dealt with the bad conservation, like Bad Life International. I contacted them and they were really very interested in the, in the piece because not, not a lot of, very little information had been told. I also had to look to check at the conservation status of this bird from the IUCN and in Nature Kenya. That is a, a conservation organization dealing with birds in Kenya. And then I also visited the, the e-commerce websites that, that in, in Kenya that really deals with a lot of sales of these birds. Can move to the next slide. Field work investigations. I had to come up with a work plan. I think I had shared how I came up with the work plan. And 
Then when I was going to the field, I had an open mind because this is a, a new topic, a topic that had been not a lot of information were out there. So I had to go with an open mind so that I come up with story angles and even new developments, which I also found when I went to the field. And then when you're dealing with uh, a story like, uh, like this, I had to be very careful even with my sources to, when contacting the, my sources and even in the field, like I could not even share the location I am in when dealing with such a story. And then when you are in the field, you have to source as much information as possible from your sources. Just like you really don't know anything. It, this was a very gray area and I had to source a lot of information because it is something very new. We can move to the next slide. And then the, some of the challenges I encountered while uh, working on this piece was lack of cooperation from state agencies. I remember writing a so many emails to different state agencies, talking to some of the researchers, talking to some of the scientists who are shy to talk about this trade, meaning it, it is something that really goes on, but not many people would really want to come out strong. I, in, in one of the instances, I was looking for the data of this bird the, from the counts, the census that they usually do. And uh, unfortunately, I could not find from the, some of the these state agencies despite several mails. Uh, some of these emails went unanswered for the entire six months I was working on the story. Then backing out by critical sources, like there was a time I had an, I had I had lined up several interviews and just hours to the interview, a source just backed out. So we that the photo, the the gazette notice shared on the other on the other side is uh when when the story ran that was four months later when the story ran uh, the the Kenyan government gazette put a gas placed a gazette notice that it was illegal to own and register by African gray African gray parrots meaning it was it changed the it 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 even brought now the Kenya Wildlife Service were, were, were now aware that there is something not, that was really not working and that they now had to, since they even did not have the data, to get to all this data so that at least it can inform on conservation of these birds, they had to put a gazette notice illegalizing owning of these parrots without permits. So we move to the... I think the final slide. Overcoming the challenges. So there are so many challenges I encountered while doing this story. And uh, some of these, to balance the story, I had to balance the story from, uh, now I gathered a lot of information from these traffickers. I even at some point I posed as a buyer and some of the traffickers were even willing sharing a lot of videos, a lot of photos with me. And even the, the photo attached there is one of the photos they were sharing because it is something that was really, that, that is very rampant. And, uh, and I utilized the networks who linked me up with the backup experts when the, the ones I had backed out, some of the networks I had, I had uh, already developed gave me some of the very critical experts who even at some point, I, they even gave me a new, a new development that uh, wildlife cyber crime was one of the biggest threats in East Africa. In fact, in Africa in general, and that in Kenya, not even, there was no single case of wildlife cybercrime that had been prosecuted. And this wildlife cybercrime 
was exploiting these birds. And uh, it was it 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 was a, a very it it was a good revelation that uh, it was very critical that I realized that it was very hard. You could you could visit the, this forest and never spot these birds, but it it only takes a click of a button to get the bird on your doorstep. I thought I think this was one of the those stories that really it it really took a lot of courage a lot of because you face a lot of people you confront even the state agencies to give you information which they really didn't have and you have to really put out there to balance your story that they never even responded and the good thing with this story is that it was uh, it brought change later it changed policies and I have shared there that four months after the investigative report, the Kenyan government made it mandatory for owners to register African gray parrots. And that is, uh, that is my uh, report. It was one of my biggest story in 2021. And I look forward for, to telling more of such stories. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline, and congratulations on producing such a great story that has led to a real world impact. Um, I, I read the story again yesterday, and something that really leapt out at me from the story was that there are now more African grey parrots living in people's homes than there are living in the wild. And that's a really shocking statistic. And I think what you've done with your story is you've shown that there's probably a whole lot more going on in terms of cybercrime in Africa with wildlife. So no doubt there will be other stories for you and other journalists to tell. Uh, thank you once again. We're going to move east now to India and uh, to Mahima Jain, who produced recently an excellent podcast episode on the threats to India's agricultural biodiversity. Um, and this was a podcast episode that appeared on Suno India's Climate Emergency podcast. So Mahima, I uh, will hand over to you now, please. Thank you, Mike. Um, so as Mike said, I produced this podcast um, on agrobiodiversity for Suno India. Uh, Suno India is an independent and multilingual podcasting platform. So before I begin <clears throat> talking about the episode, uh, I will ask you all to pause for a second and visualize what you think of when you think of agriculture in different continents, countries, or areas, and what agrobiodiversity means to you. I have never set foot in, in the United States, but thanks to growing up with American pop culture, when I think of America or American agriculture, I think of rolling fields of the same crop, what we call called monocropping. I have seen corn fields in interstellar, sprawling cotton fields in 12 years of slave, and acres of homogeneous fields in this very interesting opening montage of George Clooney's film, Up in the Air, which I will play for you now. Just, um, so if you see the 10 minute So, sorry. Yeah. Uh, now, like centuries of industrial agriculture in the West has led to loss of agrobiodiversity of and also biodiversity of crops in insects such as butterflies, earthworms, and livestock. In 2019, uh, European Court of Auditors noted that uh, because of the loss of biodiversity in, on farms, there has been uh, the farm productivity has reduced over time. Now, in contrast, when you fly over or drive through India, uh, you will not probably see uh, this homogeneous monocropping everywhere. There are places where this happens, but there is also this, um, you know, a patchwork of different plants, crops, and trees. And when you, so, uh, when you look like at India, there, I mean, there, it, it has, it's a function of various things. And, and this is what interested me, like why does, I mean, how, uh, what is the kind of biodiversity, agrobiodiversity that exists in India and how is it preserved or what are the challenges to it? 
So India is home to over 18,000 species of plants, 160 crop species with several thousand varieties, uh, and five, I mean, the statistics are there on the screen. So my story began from that premise, what defines agrobiodiversity in India and how it is shaped by different laws, practices, and farm holding patterns. Uh, the story is told through the example of Kolunji Ecological Farm in Pudukote uh, district. Uh, so first, uh, so th this farm was started about three decades ago by Oswald Quintel and doc the late Dr. Namalwar um, as a response to India's green revolution. Uh, so the Green Revolution in the 1960s and 70s was born out of this urgent need to solve India's food security crisis. Um, and so, so initially, also, um, Mr. Quintel and Dr. Namal were, were working, in fact, with the government to promote uh, Green Revolution practices. Um, and then they realized that it was damaging the ecology and agrobiodiversity and traditional methods of farming in India. Uh, India's present agricultural crisis uh, uh, and issues related to it, such as depleting water tables, soil erosion, loss of seed varieties, pest attacks, and so on, are proof of the damage done uh, by promoting unsustainable methods of farming. It has directly put the livelihoods and lives of farmers uh, in peril, and India has lost several thousand varieties of crops, insects, bees, earthworms, and microbes over the decades. Then uh, in 2020, India passed the infamous farm laws, uh, these were a set of three laws uh, which resulted in widespread protests, um, which lasted for about a year and four months. Experts noted that the intensive and commercial methods of agriculture that the laws seem to promote will worsen this crisis. So using that as a peg, I looked at uh, Kolonji as a solution in this podcast episode. Uh, here, farmers have been working on preserving different crops and cropping methods, seeds and and improving different uh, farming practices that are suited to local areas. They practice a low input pesticide-free method of farming. Uh, for example, while uh, in the episode, we speak to a couple of women who are farming and uh, one of the women uh, is, you know, uh, sowing seeds in different permutations and combination on a small patch of land. And it's random, it seems random to me, but it is, uh, she knows exactly what she's doing. And with that knowledge, uh, and, also with the knowledge that one of the crops will be probably prone to pest attack. And she's okay with that because she understands that uh, different species have different functions to perform on a field. Uh, so ecologically sensitive farming is also about acknowledging and managing the role of these birds, animals, insects in the farming process. Uh, this, so however, from a storytelling perspective, there were a few aspects that I needed to address to make uh, this more relevant. Um, one was to, it was important to move away from like this very theoretical understanding of agrobiodiversity and connecting it to the local context. But, and I think how, uh, India has a lot of examples of these solutions. Um, and it's only a matter of like looking because, uh, so that I was able to do this by speaking to farmers and practitioners who are working on different ecologically uh, sustainable methods of farming, ecological and sustainable methods of farming. Uh, the second challenge was to understand how listeners can relate to this agrobiodiversity. Um, and this, uh, uh, I was able to kind of, um, this was a bit interesting because uh, when you think of biodiversity, it is always to do with farms. You don't think of what your role in is as a consumer. Uh, so I was able to kind of bring uh, this in by linking it to food and nutrition and climate change adaptation and mitigation measures. For instance, asking questions like what varieties of rice or wheat do we eat? What are the fruits and vegetables we consume and where do they come from? How are they grown? Uh, so uh, one of the more points I mentioned in the podcast is look at the potato chips we buy. It's the same variety. Companies such as PepsiCo ensure that farmers grow a particular variety of potato in certain parts of India so that the five pieces of chips we get in an air filled packet are of the same type. Uh, the homogenization neither helps the farmers nor the environment, but it does help corporate organizations. So I opened up these questions uh, in the podcast. I really did not have the time to answer each and every one of them. Uh, another example was also about contrasting the, the agrobiodiverse methods of farming, which Kalanji was doing with banana plantations nearby which were en route to Kolonji. Uh, India is world's, India's world's largest producer of bananas, which is a very water intensive crop. But these 
banana farms around Kulanji are in a rain-fed area. Uh, so when you see miles and miles of banana farms, you have to wonder what this means for farmers, people living in the area and the environment. And imagine a small farmer growing only bananas. And if that crop fails, what will they do? You know? So that brought me to the third challenge. This was to connect agrobiodiversity to socioeconomic realities of Indian farmers. Uh, also tied back into the farmers' protests that were happening all of last year. One of the questions my editors asked was, if agrobiodiverse ecological farming is so good for the environment and people, why is it not scaling up? And should it even be scaled up? And what are the barriers? So, I mean, in solutions journalism, I realized there's also the need to look at the other part of it. Like, why? what is, what is the flip side of that solution? So one of the things uh, were, which was pretty apparent was most of the farmers who do mix cropping, uh, maybe smaller marginal farmers, and in majority of over 85% of India's farmers are smaller marginal farmers, which is less than, they own less than two hectares of land. So in a way, mixed cropping is a risk mitigation strategy to ensure their own nutritional security. Uh, the farmer's thinking is that if the groundnut fails, they'll at least have paddy or millets to fall back on, right? But on the other hand, such methods mean that farmers often do not have enough to produce, uh, enough produce to sell in the market. This raises then the question of income security. So then agrobiodiversity, uh, I mean, I then was able to broaden this out from more than species conservation or crop varieties to kind of act how it actively interacts with the way livelihoods and nutritional security are shaped. Such methods also require more labor and often women are the ones who perform that labor. So asking these questions helped me broaden out the scope of the story and link it to larger issues of equity, uh, women's role in sustainable farming, and so on. I still have many questions, and I didn't really get around to answering all of them in the podcast, which means that there is a lot to cover in agrobiodiversity. Uh, reporting on agrobiodiversity may not be tied to the news cycle or may not be akin to like breaking news stories, but it is an ongoing process, I believe, and that defines uh, and this defines like how we live. Agrobiodiversity kind of links to our choices as consumers or you know people. And I hope uh, more people will report on it. I'll, I, I'll drop the link to the podcast in the chat. Um, and uh, thank you so much. The episode is called The Future is Ecological and Biodiverse Farming on Suno India's Climate Emergency. Thank you. Thanks, Mahima. That was really interesting. And I, and I do urge everyone who's watching today to go and find the link to that podcast episode, because the issues that Mahima is covering are uh, relevant to so many countries other than India. Uh, of course, if you're in India, they'll be even more relevant. And uh, I think she's done a really good job of taking this biodiversity story, but also bringing in all of those other angles that she's just talked about. So the climate angle, the food security, the, the gender and equity issues. Uh, it's a really rich listen and, uh, and I very much enjoyed it. So thank you, Mahima, and thank you for talking to us about it today. Uh, I've got a quick question for you, Mahima. Um, what has been the reaction to to your podcast? Have you have you heard from listeners? Have you had any any feedback from anybody about it? Um, so this podcast, uh, I mean, I have heard the feedback that they do not look at bio. Am I on mute? Oh. Um, so yeah, I have heard the podcast. I mean, that the podcast kind of opened avenues to thinking about agrobiodiversity and how it relates to people uh, in their daily lives. So that's been a good thing. And um, the, the other thing has been uh, the, uh, that this, this podcast has kind of also helped me kind of, uh, look at more issues and interact with a lot of different farmers group and look at. So one of the things I, I heard one of uh, farmer farmers activists say is that um, you know, the, the protests against the farm laws were a missed opportunity for environmentalists. Like if they had stepped in and looked at it and protested about this as well, it would have been an interesting angle to take. Uh, environment was not really at the forefront of the farm, farmers protests. So that was an interesting take for me kind of uh, to understand that, so yeah. Thank you. And I have a question here for Caroline from uh, a journalist in Guatemala called Lucy Calderon. She says, congratulations, Caroline, great piece. My question is, how did you get your editor's support to cover this story? Because as you said, it's a topic that not too many people know about or care about. And despite its importance, your editor could have just said, they're just parrots. So how did you get the support? And this is a question that uh, Mahima, you can also answer about, um, you know, how do you get editors interested in biodiversity stories and what's your experience of trying to convince them? So Caroline first, please. 
Sure, that is a very a very good question. So this this story is uh, for someone to tell such a story. I had a very compelling pitch. You shock your editor even when you are pitching. You you make them shocked so that they really see. So because it was the first time when they really they they really had to think that. Uh, so the parrots that people keep in their houses are illegal. Yes, I had to give even the statistics to tell to tell my editor that it was the world's most traded bird and it was illegal, despite all the regulations from uh, conservation international conservation bodies. This trade is not many people even knew. So your pitch should be very compelling, and. I think also there is someone who asked about how I how I managed to, to, to take photos and videos. In fact, th this is one of the most interesting stories when I was covering because I did not even bother taking photos because these people who are selling, it is, a, it is cyber crime. They are all over the internet. When someone is selling something, you ask them if they can share photos, they can share videos and they were all over sharing. I even had a video, I what I did, for my video, I had the experts talk about uh, talk about the, how the, about the trade of these birds. That unlike the big five we talk about, there is a lot of uh, smuggling of the the small five like the lizards, the snakes, the tortoises, and such African grey parrots. And then I had to take the clips from these people who are sharing with me to use them as photos, how they are entertaining at home, because there is even someone who shared uh, a video of an African gray parrot talking. The, the, the bird was pronouncing Corona, and I used them to make short videos to accompany the story. Great, thank you, Caroline. Mahima, do you have any, uh, any insights to add on that point? One thing, as Caroline said, is a strong pitch. So, I mean, uh, agrobiodiversity has been on my head for a while, but the farm laws really presented an opportunity to kind of talk about it. It was one of the biggest things to happen since the 70s in India. So it was kind of easy to convince my editor to say that uh, people are talking about the other aspects of farm laws, like contract farming and stuff, but we also need to talk about agrobiodiversity here, which was kind of threatened in the past and continues to be like a problem and continues to be threatened uh, as we implement such laws. So that was uh, kind of the uh, easiest way for me to get into kind of reporting this story. And yeah, my editor was pretty much on board because uh, not many people were at that time reporting on uh, the farm laws from an uh, agrobiodiversity perspective. So that helped. Thank you. I've got a, I've got a question here for Sam. Uh, which is about the course itself. And the person who's asked the question is Caroline Guzman, who says, do we need to have previous knowledge in science or in scientific data to understand the contents of the course? No, Caroline, you do not. Um, the first module, actually the first two modules um, are really directed at uh, laying out some of the concepts that you'll need throughout the rest of the course. Um, but even then um, it's done in a manner that I think is very approachable to to journalists and others who do not have a background in the sciences, um, uh, biological or otherwise. So um, by all means, go into it, um, assuming that you don't need any previous knowledge. Great, thank you, Sam. Uh, and now a question for both of the journalists, or in fact, all three of the journalists here. Uh, how do journalists write stories about topics that somebody else has covered before? So what, what are the techniques that you can use to uh, to tell a different version of, of a story that's already been reported elsewhere. I think that's what the questioner is, is getting at with this question. I'll, I'll just start off um, because this is sort of a nice uh, segue into some aspect of the course and I'm shamelessly promoting. So this is a, a good opportunity. There is a, um, a module that we have about localizing biodiversity stories that's precisely about this issue about um, localizing and finding new um, angles for uh, larger stories or stories that you've seen covered elsewhere. 
Um, I think some of the strategies that um, you can employ include um, finding um, interesting character, an interesting source, um, an interesting, um, in this case, if it's, a, it's, it's a, if it's about a specific species, um, a species or a subject that hasn't really been explored in any depth and um, using that as kind of your um, entry point into um, uh, differentiating your story from, from previous pieces. Um, and uh, of course, as both Mahima and, and Carolyn have um, beautifully uh, shown today, there are ways of exploring sort of timeless issues such as corruption, cybercrime, and, um, and uh, in the case of Mahima, sort of uh, industrialization of agriculture um, in ways that are both localized and have sort of new and contemporary spins on them. So I think we, it's really um, not necessarily easy, but it, um, it, it, it definitely, it's a lot more, there are a lot more availabilities and opportunities to cover these types of things that seem like they've been um, covered ad nauseum and, and multiple times before. And you just have to think about sort of a few different kinks and adjustments, and then um, you'll, you'll be surprised, I think, by, by the outcomes. Would you like to add anything, Mahima or Caroline, on that point? Sure, I can. As I think, as as uh, Sam put it, that you can always localize. Most of these stories we tell have been told, so many many times. But we always look for a a new angle. There's always you you can always twist a story to fit into what you really want to talk about. Like wildlife cyber crime is a big. Thing currently, and uh, most of the countries cannot really fight. They, they are they lack capacities. Especially, I can talk from a, an African perspective that it has never been easy. So you can always look for an entry point to talk about the, the, the stories. Like on my case, I had to use uh, I with an open mind that I had when I was going to the field. I was going to pursue a part of the story. But later I realized it was a bigger story talking about the, the wildlife cyber crime and the trade routes, the trafficking routes, because experts said to tell me how even the trafficking routes from West Africa into the East Africa and out of Africa into other countries, how they traffic. So I think the story, you can always tell your story in any other angle. There is always a new angle for, for for a story just what you only have to do is do a lot of interviews ask a lot of questions you will always find you will always crack it somehow yeah, i think sam and caroline have covered it all but just to add for me it was one of the things that i often tend to do as anthropogenic it may be i always try to connect it back to people like how they will think of a story and how kind of they are going to, how they fit into the equation of either destruct, destroying, as with, which Caroline has also done, like in her story, she's talking about pirates, but also people. Um, so yeah, with farming as well, I'm not, I try not to talk just about the farmers. I also try to kind of understand as consumers in urban cities, what role we play to kind of, uh, to accelerate, in accelerating that destruction of agrobiodiversity. And even within the uh, broad uh, topic of biodiversity, when I was, I remember applying for the grant, I thought of many things like animals and stuff, but the last thing I chose was just agrobiodiversity because I just felt that was a huge um, kind of, uh, in terms of localizing these stories, those stories were kind of missing, I felt. I mean, they are there, but they're not often told in the national context in India. So, yeah. Great, thank you all. And as biodiversity teaches us, everything is indeed connected. And, and if, you, if you look far enough and deep enough, you'll find those connections that will carry you all the way back to your prospective readers and listeners and, and find a, a localized angle for your story. We've got just a few minutes left. So I've got one more question here from uh, Santosh Digal, who says, was it hard to gather the required data for your stories? I'll just answer that quickly. Uh, with the agriculture, I think it's less difficult than it is with, say, wildlife. Uh, but the other issue in agrobiodiversity 
university and like these new models of farming i felt was there was not enough research uh, there is a lot of there is a lot of gray areas uh, that uh, you know not of all of not all of it is quantified or codified and i mean that also raised a question of whether they need, need all should all traditional practices be documented study like that was another question i had um, so yes the, i mean i found that localized research was missing and so that means like I could not probably get data on um, how particular models of Kulunji farming practices kind of succeed or not, right? Like I probably know how many people adapt to it or how many people have taken it up. And if more people have taken it up, maybe it is successful. But I mean, that does not kind of explain whether, so will, if these models had to be scaled, will they solve, in, will they feel a billion stomachs in, like which is India, right? Like, can you kind of make it that big? So that is, uh, there are organizations doing it, like it is certain stuff, but again, you really have to look hard for such kind of specific data points, I feel, yeah. Thank you, Mahima. And Sam, there's, uh, the, the course does cover data journalism as well, doesn't it? There are some uh, information yeah. on sources of data. For journalists and is, and indeed and indeed there's also uh, a resource list that um when you register for the course that is um, hyperlinked um in the landing page that has um resources that you can consult um i'll also say that ej in the, in the coming weeks will be um hosting a environmental data uh, resource list a database of sorts that um you can also use to consult for biodiversity and other um other subjects so uh, look out for that. And there's another question related to the course here, Sam. Uh, somebody called Dr. Prabhakar Campbell has said, how helpful is the course for media teaching professionals and researchers? I think it's really, um, I think it could be quite helpful. Um, obviously, um, there is quite a bit about um, biodiversity uh, subjects and um, issues that pertain specifically to environmental journalism. Um, so, uh, keeping that in mind, um, it, that's definitely the flavor of the course, but yes, there are several modules and parts of uh, different modules that I think are generalizable and could be useful um, for media training, um, including the resources and, and sources module, the localizing biodiversity stories, even the solutions stories um, module, which is probably one of the one was one of the more difficult ones for me to develop because um, you know, solutions journalism is still very much in its early days of development as a field, and so there's not necessarily a lot of agreement about what um, exactly a good solution story is or what a good solutions biodiversity story might be. So I think you'll see even in that module sort of the groundwork for how to um, begin to uh, do teaching and um, training on the subject of solutions journalism. So I think it, it, it could be quite generalizable for media training and, and um, students in that field, even if they have no particular interest in biodiversity. And I think any researchers looking at the course will hopefully gain an insight into what journalists uh, need and what how journalists operate and hopefully uh, maybe be able to communicate with journalists in a different way going forward. Mahima, there's one more question here for you. What made you decide to tell this story as a podcast rather than uh, as a written report? Um, well, I've been uh, primarily a features writer for a long time, and I was experimenting with podcasts, and I felt like uh, the story, I mean, when I went to the piece and was recording the sounds, there was a certain quality which kind of I was able to capture uh, about how these women work on farms, how they interact, and I felt like there was an honesty to the medium that I wanted to explore, so it was purely a choice of kind of experimenting with a new medium. I had worked on like videos before. So I thought this would make for a great podcast and collaboration with Climate Emergency really helped because they were great editors who kind of helped me kind of shape this podcast. Thanks, Mahima. And, and the, we did put the link into the chat for your for, for your podcast so people can find it there and also your story, Caroline, as well. We, we've come to the end of our allotted hour. So I'd like to say thank you to all of the panelists who joined us today and thanks for sharing your insights and your stories and for taking the time to prepare your presentations. Thank you also to everyone else who's joined by uh, listening in and providing us with some really interesting questions as well. 
there will be a recording available of this of this webinar shortly on the EJN website. And as I said before, I encourage you, if you're not already a member of the Earth Journalism Network, to register and uh, become a member so you can find out about future events like this, as well as any funding opportunities, story grants, fellowships, and, and other opportunities. So thank you all very much. And uh, I hope you have a, a good day, evening, night, morning, wherever you are in the world. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mahima. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everyone.